everybody. Welcome to the summit. <laughs> I'm Alicia, and this is Casey here. Y'all say hey to Casey. So Casey is our awesome Summit Serve intern right now, and she's kind of fabulous. So I thought we'd interview her, get to know her a little bit. Casey, why did you want to intern in the Serve ministry? Why do you want to serve? So I see serving as a way to honor God with my life. And as I was growing up, I would see issues around my community and worldwide. And I thought, instead of just talking about it, I was going to be about it. That's so awesome. You're kind of fabulous. OK, right? So let's get to the hard-hitting questions. What is your favorite breakfast food? <laughs> so I'm a potato girl, and I love hash browns. So does anyone else love hash browns in here? Yeah. Like the unsung hero of breakfast, right? So you know who has great hash browns? Um, Cracker Barrel uh -huh. that just opened down the street. Is anyone going there after this? No, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Good luck with the wait. I'm sorry. In advance. <laughs> it's so true, right? Well, you know what we should do to celebrate? A giveaway. Let's do a little giveaway. I have a Cracker Barrel gift card right here in my hands. So yesterday was leap day. Did anybody have a birthday yesterday? A leap day? Oh, my gosh. It's very rare. Do you see right somebody? There. Back there. You do? <laughs> you did? Really? For a happy birthday, that's so crazy. So I'm gonna give you a Cracker Barrel gift card since you only get to celebrate once every four years. Yay, you win, happy birthday. And thank you to Casey for taking that back there. Everybody say bye, Casey. Bye. All right, so if you've been coming to the summit for a couple weeks or you've been coming for a few years and you're like, hey, what's next for me at the summit? What's my next step here? So we have a class called What's next? And it's coming up in March, and you can see the details up here behind me. You'll notice that it's at 845 on a Sunday morning. So we did that so that you guys can come for 15 or so minutes before the service, hang out in the gallery that's over there, get your questions answered, and then you can go on to the service. So it's easy peasy. All you got to do is sign up through our app or our website for that. Now, we're in our In Repair series. We're talking about healing, and it's been so great. In a minute, we're going to do one of our favorite things, which is sing with the band. But first, I want to pray with you guys, so if you'll bow your heads with me. God, thank you for what you're teaching us about healing. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your strength through this process. And God, just help us continue to learn what it like, what it looks like to be healing. And we love you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here this morning.
No high, no death, no life will find no bread could ever separate us from your love. No failure, no mistake, no loneliness or pain could ever separate us from your love. Could ever separate us from your love And on the other side of everything I'm afraid of You were standing with your arms wide open Wide open And even in my deepest doubts and wonder You were standing I'm here, made strong, and I found where I belong. Forever I'm alive now in your love. I'm changed, I'm changed by your amazing grace. Forever I'm alive now in your love. And on the other side of everything. If I make my bed in darkness, if I try my best to hide, you know the farthest ocean, you give the morning its light. I can't run from your presence, cause there's no place that far. So I run to you, my Savior, there's safety in your arms. If I make my bed in darkness, if I try my best to hide, you know the farthest ocean, give the morning its light, I can't run from your presence, cause there's no place that far, so I run to you, my Savior, there's safety in you. I'm afraid of you were standing with your arms wide open, wide open, and even in my deepest doubts and wonder, you were standing with your arms wide open, wide open on the other side of everything I'm afraid. Thank y'all so much for worshiping with us this morning. You can have a seat. We've got a special announcement from our Oak Ridge location. Hey, Summit Church, it's Pastor Andy from our Oak Ridge location. I am standing in the lobby of our new facility that we are building as a church here in Oak Ridge. And uh, it seems like it was just yesterday that we were walking around this piece of property here in Oak Ridge, dreaming about what it could mean for us as a church and for our families, but better yet, for our community. I wanted to kind of give you a quick update. As you can tell behind me, the walls are up, the electrical is done, 
HVAC is going in, the plumbing is almost done, and they're starting to actually hang drywall and do some mudding. So it won't be long before we will be hosting people right here in this new facility and sharing the love of Jesus at an even greater level in the Northwest Guilford community. So thank you so much for all that you're doing to make this a reality for our church and help us reach more and more people all throughout the triad. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Now, we're not at the point yet where we know when the big day will be. We're getting closer to be able to start talking about that. So we'll keep you on, on tap with all that. Um, the interesting thing being um, a, a church like the Summit is that when we, we start these locations, uh, up until this point, all three of our locations have started portably. Uh, meaning they don't meet in a permanent facility like this. Like Kernersville, uh, this location met in a middle school for eight years until we were able to build this and move in. And now Oak Ridge has been meeting about the same amount of time in, in that elementary school, and Jamestown's meeting at Ragsdale High School. So it, it's funny how in a community where a lot of people, they don't like acknowledge you as a real church until you like have a building. Like, oh, well, oh, so now you're a real church. Oh, okay. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, because here's the deal. Here's when we've talked about this before, is that buildings are just tools. That's what they are. They're just tools. Um, that God's presence, God's spirit, doesn't live in a building. So technically, this is not the house of God. And we're not building a house of God in Oak Ridge. This is the house of God. The Holy Spirit of God indwells our lives. And the New Testament could not be more clear about that. And so it's, it, but at the same time, buildings are important, and here's why. Because it kind of sends a message to the community. We're putting roots down in your neighborhood, and we are here to stay. And that's exciting, and, and we cannot wait to see what all of this allows us to do. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for those of you that serve and give and you're a part of what God is doing here. And if you're not serving and you're not giving, imagine if you got on board with what God was doing here, how much more we would be able to do. It is our goal, it is our dream to be able to put roots down in strategic communities all over the triad so that we can let as many people know about the incredible love of Jesus so they can receive his love and share his love. I did not get electrocuted. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm going to stand real still and say this next part. We are starting week three of our series called In Repair. And to get us in the mindset, we have a story we want to share with you. So turn your attentions to the screen and hear Shannon's story. Uh, well, I was born with a hole in my heart, and uh, they had to patch that up when I was a baby. And at five years old, I had my first open heart surgery. When I was 14, I know I had another open heart surgery. I was exempt from a lot of the, the playing in, in school and stuff, the uh, recess and stuff like that. Other kids playing outside, you know, riding their bikes. It's something I couldn't do. I guess the fear of, of having another heart spell, you know, or my, um, I would get tired easy, you know. Around 11 when it first happened, that my heart went into a fast rhythm. And uh, I didn't want to tell nobody about it because I didn't want to go, go to the hospital, you know. So, but they found out once I went in, that it happened there, and they found out what it was. It wasn't until later on that I realized that it's something I'm going to have to deal with, you know, for the rest of my life, so. See, I would get sick and I couldn't keep nothing down and I thought um, that I maybe had the flu or something, so I went to the doctor and they said I was dehydrated and my belly was swollen and uh, 
my ankles were swollen and stuff. And um, so he told me to just, you know, just go home and drink plenty of water. He decided to take me to the emergency room and because I wasn't getting any better. I got up and I just collapsed and I barely remember what went on. Yeah, I had to go back in for surgery to repair uh, a, melody, a a valve with a melody valve, and the surgeon he nicked my lung, and I, I was out of it for weeks, you know, and um, I was hooked up to all these machines. It's just, it was scary. I don't remember very much going in there because I was so out of it, you know, because my kidneys and liver was shutting down and stuff. Well, my body was tired, and I was just, you know, just tired of dealing with it. And Kent said, let's, let's do this. Kent, my husband, he said, let's do this one more time. One more time. I had to learn to walk again, you know, in rehab. Um, I stayed there for a couple months or so and and I learned to walk and build my strength up and stuff. Well, I miss being outside the most, just going out and sitting outside. Yeah, being around people, uh, my little doggies, I miss them. Um, being able to go to church, I miss that. I would cry a lot and uh, I would pray about it and it was just, it was a lot emotionally to, for me to deal with, yeah, and mentally. I knew my family and friends were behind me, and, and so I just rallied on, you know. I said, I can do this. I couldn't, I couldn't give up for them. You gotta keep, keep trying, keep going. It takes a lot of courage to open up like that, to be able to kind of pull the curtain back and, and let people hear the struggle, to see the parts that are not so glamorous, and to kind of open up and, and talk about how God is healing our brokenness, how God is repairing us and putting us back together. I actually got to see Shannon at the earlier service um, at our Kernersville location this morning. And to see her and where she is now is so encouraging. Maybe you can identify with that part of her story, not because what you're facing is physical, like hers. Maybe yours is relational, or maybe yours is with an addiction, or maybe it's a financial thing. It's an anxiety, depression thing, or maybe... Regardless of what it is, you can identify with the, I'm going to give it one more shot. I'm going to give it one more shot. Because you're just not going to give up. That's a beautiful thing. It's a challenging thing, but it's exactly where I believe God wants us to be. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our time together is what this looks like to open up about the brokenness. Open up about how God is repairing us and putting us back together. Now, to make sure that we're all kind of in this together, I, just so that you all feel like you're in it together, I, I thought I would kind of say something that I think applies to everybody here. I think every single one of us here are probably really big fans of deodorant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. And somebody here or at one of our other locations is having an aha moment right now, and you're going, uh, that's what I forgot. <laughs> well, the people around you already know that. And, <laughs> isn't that a horrible feeling when you begin to go, is that me? Is that? <laughs> no, awful. No, that's too much. Too much. A few years ago, here's why I bring this up. I'm going somewhere with this. A few years ago, there was a commercial, a deodorant commercial. That has everything to do with what we're talking about here with brokenness and being in repair. 
And this, this commercial, even if you didn't use this deodorant, you know exactly kind of the tagline of this commercial. In fact, I'm going to start it, and I'm going to let you finish it. Okay, here we go. Ready? Let's all participate. Never let them see you sweat. sweat. See? You knew it. Never let them see you sweat, which is odd because sweating is actually a very good thing. It's how our body cools itself, and it's how we eliminate toxins. So for those of you that have stopped up all of your sweat, you're just one toxic cloud walking around. You smell good, okay, but you're toxic. Just thought I'd let you know. But here's what's interesting, okay? When it, when it comes to life, a lot of people live that way. It's not just about the deodorant they wear. They live life that way. Never let them see you sweat. I can't let anybody know what's really going on. Keep it to myself. I keep it to myself. I, I keep this bottled up. No, no, just smile. Put a smile on your face. Mama always said, put a smile on your face, and here you go. Don't let them know that you're struggling. Don't let anybody know that you're hurting. Don't let anybody know that you have questions. Don't let anybody know that you're struggling with doubts and fears and issues. Keep it on the down low. Never let them see you sweat. It's great for deodorant. It's a lousy way to live. I think it would be better for us to take a cue from AA when it comes to this. Alcoholics Anonymous, even if you don't know anything about it, you probably are very well aware of how their meetings begin and how they introduce themselves to one another. And some of this is cliche. I get it. And may, it may not be exactly like this in every AA meeting or NA meeting, but the premise is you introduce yourself, you tell them your name and what you're struggling with. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm an addict. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm struggling. Hi, and you say your name, and then, because here's what AA has figured out that all of us would be very wise to clue into, is that you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. You cannot heal what you do not acknowledge, what you refuse to admit. In order to heal, or repair something, you got to stare it in the face and call it what it is and open up about it. Now, when it comes to our brokenness, though, and, and it comes to dealing with the, the ways that we're in repair, you and I as human beings tend to gravitate to extremes. Isn't that just, isn't that just the way life is, right? We, we like extremes. We find ourselves gravitating towards extremes. Let me, let me give you an example. I don't know how you're dealing with brokenness, and I don't know how you're in repair. I don't know if it's a relationship thing, a money thing, an anxiety thing, uh, a physical health thing. But here's what we often do. We either hide it or we highlight it. We spend all this time and energy trying to hide it or we highlight it. And here's what I'm talking about. Let's start over here. We hide it. Pretend. Never let them see you sweat. Keep it on the down low. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Fine, thank you. I'm fine. I'm just fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. No problems. No problems here. No issues. Got no issues at all. No, no. We have a word for that, and it's actually a cliche. We call that being in denial. Yeah. Or you undershare because you want anyone to think that you got issues. And Christians can really struggle with this because a lot of times Christians think we have to present this air that we have it all together because we are followers of Jesus, right? And we believe in the one who can heal. We trust and follow the one who is God in the flesh. So if we open up and admit we're struggling, oh, that can't be good. So Christians, right? In order to seem spiritual, we hide. We hide. We wear masks. I'm good. I'm good. All's good. All's good. I'm blessed. Blessed. Hashtag blessed. You're good. It's all good. Oh, good. God's good. And we're, we're dying inside. We're, we're just falling apart inside because we don't, we, we want to appear spiritual. The problem is that's a false spirituality. Right? It's a false holiness. Well, and I know the thinking is I don't want people to know. I don't want people to think that I don't have faith. I don't want people to think that I don't trust God. I don't want people to think that I'm just a big old mess on the inside. I don't want people to think that I don't believe God. I don't want people to think, and then you fill in the blanks. But here's the deal. We can already see that something's up. The people around you know. The people around you can see 
that something's happened, that you're dealing with something. And here's the truth. If you don't open up and stop hiding, we'll just kind of fill in the blanks ourselves. Isn't that what we do? Right? Did you notice something was weird with her? Oh, I bet I know what's going on. <laughs> do you notice he's just kind of standoffish? I bet. Hey, I bet I know. We just fill in the blanks. Isn't that how we do? So it's just so much better just to stop this whole hiding thing and stop pretending and wearing the masks. And... But at the same time, don't go to this extreme either where you highlight it. Right? Over here, it's like, I, I don't got any problems. What problems? I don't have problems. Over here, it's like, all I got is problems. <laughs> My life is just one big problem. And it's like we wear our issues on our T-shirts and we lead into it. It becomes our identity. We attach who we are to it, introduce ourselves that way, and we're constantly wanting to talk about it. That's all you want to talk about, your problems. All you want to talk about is your pain. All you want to talk about is what happened to you, what they did to you, what they said to you, or what you did to yourself. It's all you want to talk about. It's called living the life of a victim. Yeah, some of you, you're, you don't hide. Some of you, we wish you'd hide a little. Because <laughs> you, you overshare. You just overshare. And you, and, and, you know, you don't want to follow these people on social media. You just don't. And you're just like, oh, no, no, no. How long is that post? Oh, no, I don't want to know all of that. That's, woo, TMI, TMI. I don't, too, much, too much information for those of you that, yeah. Oh, LOL. <laughs> So we either hide it or, or, or we highlight it, and it becomes our identity, and we one-up people. Oh, you think that's bad? Let me tell you what happened to me. And we get fixated on what happened to us, and all we want to talk about is what happened to us. There's a better way. Somewhere in between these extremes is where healing takes place. With all your issues... Somewhere between these extremes is where we begin to experience what it means to truly be in repair. Somewhere within the extremes of hiding and, and oversharing and highlighting it is where we begin to healthily open up and say, yeah, I got some issues, yeah, but it's not who I am, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. In fact, the attitude of healing, the attitude of healthily open up, sounds like this. I'm not there yet. I got some problems. I got some pain. I got some issues. But through Christ, I'm getting there. I'm not there yet. Okay. I'm not there yet. But through Christ, he's getting me there. I haven't arrived I haven't arrived. I got some problems. I got some problems. We got some issues. Our marriage is struggling. I, financially, I don't have it all together. And in my job, I have some insecurities. And yeah, yeah, I worry a lot. And yeah, I have a lot of doubts and questions. And yes, I deal with depression. Yes, I'm an addict. Yes, that's, that's what I deal with. But, so I'm not saying I got it all together. But through Christ, I'm healing. Through Christ, I'm in repair. Through Christ, I'm getting there. And here's the difference. The difference is... When you open up what your intention is, let me show you. A lot of times our intention is, look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's why we go to these extremes. That's what hiding is all about. Look at me, I ain't got no issues. Look at me, I got it all together. Look at me, what problems? Look at me, what pain? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm fine. Look at me, or... Look at me, I'm a mess. <laughs> Look at me, I'm pitiful. Look at me, I have no friends. Look at me, I just, need, I just need constant help. Look at me, look at me. When your intention is attention, then it's look at me, look at me, look at me. But the healthy healing is when we turn the focus off ourselves and we say, now let's look at what God is doing in my life. Now, that's not a cliche. I don't want you to see it like that. That's not just one of these Christian things to say. It really is a different perspective, and it looks like this. Yeah, I got some issues. It's, it, it, hey, listen, it's not my identity. 
I am dealing with some stuff, but I want to focus on not me and what happened to me. I want to focus and talk about what God is doing in my life because of these issues. How God is healing me and putting me back together and helping me and growing me and challenging me and making me stronger and rescuing me and pouring grace into my life and love into my life and bringing peace to my life. How God is putting me back together and repairing me. See, the intention then is to draw the attention not to ourselves, but to God. And it's such a healthier way to go about this. See, healthy people don't want to don't want to come across as flawless because they know they're not. But they also don't want the attention on themselves. When you're healing and then you're in a healthy place learning to healthily open up, the focus is not look at me. It's like let's talk about what God is doing in me and through me because of all these things that have brought brokenness into my life. There's a beautiful balance here and I want to show you what it looks like in the life of Paul. The, the other um, week when I was preparing to, put, to bring this to you, I, I was going a completely different direction um, with, with, the, with the sermon, talk, message, um, however you want to refer to what I'm doing right now. But. And then I came across this passage that I had read many, many, many times before. But it was like, okay, I'm reading that, and I'm like, okay, well, that's good to know. Well, that's good to know. But this time, it just really jumped off the page at me. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second. Let me back up and read this again. What's going on here? See, Paul had been through a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff. The guy had been through so much. Serious stuff. And I began to see that he intentionally opened up to share some of the difficulties he was going through, not because he wanted attention, not because he wanted pity. Here's my sob story. Here's my sad story. I want everyone to feel bad for me. No. His whole point was to help people understand what God was doing in his life. So the focus wasn't on him. It was on God. And I'm like, that's beautiful. Let me show you. Paul writes to a group of his friends in Corinth at a local church there. And he says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, there's something you need to know. So what we're getting ready to read, Paul is opening up. We think you ought to know about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. And then he dumps it on them. Here we go. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Some of you know what that's like. Some of you are there right now. You are at the point where you feel like I am beyond my ability to endure this anymore. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. Some of you actually feel like this is it. This is going to be the end of me. I will not survive this. This is going to take me down. Now, now, here's the deal, though. Paul was literally, not figuratively, not just in hyperbole, he really believed he was going to physically stop breathing and die. This wasn't one of those, oh, my gosh, did you see she gave me that nasty look? I'm just going to die. No. Oh, man, you know, he's just giving me the cold shoulder. I mean, this is just killing me. No, 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 it's not that. This is serious stuff, serious stuff, like some of what you were going through, some really heavy, serious stuff. He said, we expected to die. Now, if he had stopped right then, if he had stopped right there, the conclusion would have been, come on, Paul, he's kind of a downer, right? Come on, don't, it's like so depressing. Hey, you're just discouraging us, just telling us how bad it is and what happened to you and what happened to you. And... But he didn't stop there. He brings balance to this. Watch. But as a result, as a result of what? Of what happened to me. The brokenness, the, the things that were going on that I needed repair in, I need help in, we stopped relying on ourselves. And learn to rely only on God. Wait a second. Now the attention's changing. Now the focus is shifting. Rely only on God who raises the dead. Isn't that interesting? He said, I thought I was going to die, but I was like, hey, wait a second. The God I believe in can raise dead people. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. Amazing. Which, side note, okay, Paul fully expected to kind of be in the same scenario again. 
He said, so he rescued us and he'll rescue us again. Implying, and when it gets bad again, and when all hell breaks loose again, he will continue to do the same thing, which that's a good thing for you to remember. And we're not talking about that part today. We kind of talked about that earlier in the series, but that's huge. Brokenness is not a one and done thing. There's always something else coming down the road, right? It's not like, okay, well, I survived that, so life should be easy from now on. No. God brings healing to brokenness in our past, and something will happen again that God will continue to bring healing to. But watch. Did you see the shift? Do you see the focus change? It's not about poor me, poor me, poor me. It's about look at what God has done, and he'll keep doing it. God will continue to rescue us. And then another shift happens. And he starts bringing this to the broader audience. Watch. This is beautiful. And you are helping us. Who's you? He's talking about his friends, his brothers and sisters, his fellow Christians, his fellow believers. People that are following Jesus alongside him that he has a relationship with. He said, guys, and this involves you too. You're a part of this too. Because you've been praying for us. This is beautiful. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. This was unifying. There are few things that can be as unifying if we allow them to be as brokenness, as pain, suffering, and problems. You see, isn't it interesting? We often want to isolate, use these things to isolate each other. But Paul was like, oh, you need to know that you guys are part of this too. You've been praying for us. And you were a part of what God did because you were praying for us. So let's get excited together. Paul is like saying, guys, we're all in this together. I went through a horrible thing and God rescued us and God is bringing healing to that and God is helping me and you guys are a part of this. So thank you. Thank you for praying. Thank you for standing in there with me. I I love the unifying nature, which kind of brings us to this next part that's so very important. It's, It's the incredible role that community plays in healing and in how God repairs us. Or let's say like this, healing is personal, but it's not private. It's personal, but it's not private. It's personal. What happened to you is personal, but you need to know that what happened to you is not meant to be private. That's why we hide it, right? That we think, oh, we just keep that to ourselves, keep that to ourselves. You heal best and repair best in the context of healthy community, not in isolation. And isn't it interesting, often when our life begins to fall apart, we isolate and insulate. We isolate and insulate. We run into a corner, poor me, poor me, poor me. Nobody knows. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands. Nobody understands what I think. Nobody understands what I feel. Nobody understands what I'm going through. And nobody knows how to help me. What? No, 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 no. That's not it at all. In fact, you'd be surprised just how many people have walked the same kind of road. You'd be surprised just how many people know that same kind of pain. Maybe not the scenario is exactly the same, but at certain levels, pain is pain. Pain is pain. And so all of that is very personal, but it was not ever meant to be private. So involve others. That's what opening up is about. Involve others. Yeah, that can feel a little risky, but that's how healing happens. Because let me remind you, we all see your scars. We all can tell. Something happened here. There's a limp. There's trauma. There's evidence that something happened at some point. And on one hand, people will just kind of fill in the blank. But here's the other thing, and this is dangerous. This is sad. And it happens way too often. If you don't healthily open up about what God is doing in your life, there will be people that look at you and assume you have it all together, which you don't. But they will assume that you have it all together and they are all alone. Because you can't identify with them and nobody can identify with them. And listen, not only do you not want to feel alone, you don't want other people to feel alone because you won't open up and share. Hey, me too. Us too. Yeah. See, it's so personal, but, oh, man, it could not be further than private. Open up. Now, you can't open up to everyone. And you can't open up 
first of all, you can't open up to everyone because we don't have time for all that. Okay? Now think about it. Right? That's, that's the oversharing. When you're opening up to everyone, you're like, eh, thanks. And you can't open up to just anyone because some people you can't trust. You can't trust that kind of information just with anybody. But you got to open up to someone. Can't open up to everyone. You can't open up to just anyone, but you must open up to someone. Be wise about it. It doesn't mean, dude, that you just go down to the office and you dump your, you know, your spill your guts on that gal down at the office. First of all, it's dishonoring your wife. You need to be careful with that. And it doesn't mean, ladies, you just go down to the office and just, here's this guy that'll listen to my husband. He don't get me, so I'm just going to, you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. You need to use wisdom. Let me give you the healthy, the healthy context in the context of a local church where you can open up. That's what small groups are for. That's what small groups are great for. In the safety of a group, you can say, this is what I'm struggling with. And this is what I've been through. And you'll be surprised how around the table or around the living room, as one person after another says, here's what I'm facing. Here's what I'm working through. Here's what happened. But this is what God is doing. And this is what God is showing me. And this is what God is teaching me. And this is how God is growing me. Then person by person by person, there's going to be this light bulb moment. They're like, yes, me too. Yes, us too. And you know what? I thought I was the only one. I thought I was alone. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's a beautiful thing when we realize this is not private. A few weeks ago, I was made aware of something that I didn't know existed. And I don't know how I made it my whole 25 years of adulthood here. Um, what? I said adulthood, which means... Yeah, anyway, I'm older than I look. I don't know how I made it this far into my life without knowing this and seeing this. It's just, this is huge, and the more I looked into it, it's like everywhere, and you probably know this. You, you probably, what I'm getting ready to share with you, you're probably like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that, we know that. Someone introduced me, actually one of our young staff members, when they knew that this is kind of the direction I was going, she came up to me and she said, do you know about the Japanese art form of kitsugi? Kintsugi. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I hope, I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Kintsugi. In Kintsugi, they break pottery. They take broken pottery. And, and, and then with a latex resin adhesive type mixture, they mix in that adhesive powdered gold, powdered silver, or powdered platinum, and they put this pottery back together in such a way that the powdered gold and silver and platinum highlights the scars in just a way that brings great value and beauty to it. In fact, let me show you a picture. It'd be easier for you to see it. Look at that. Isn't this beautiful? See that gold? Now, if you look at that and you're like, that's amazing. I didn't even know this existed. This is more valuable now, hang with me, than it was before it got all busted up and put back together. This, because of Kintsugi, is actually more beautiful than it would be flawless. And here's the other thing. Do you know that means somebody's job is to bust up pots? <laughs> what a cool job that is, right? You go to work every day, and you might have no anger, right? You go to work every day, and you just break stuff, right? Like, break this up, because we've got to put this together today. And so they break it on purpose. Get this. They break it on purpose so that when it's put back together, it displays a greater beauty a greater value than before. Could it be, could it be that the brokenness that you have experienced in your life, God has allowed so that, so that when he's finished putting you back together, it's like Kintsugi. You're worth more now than you were before that happened to you. 
you're more valuable now. You're, you're actually ma more mature now. You've learned more now because you've been a recipient of the investments of God's grace through the pain, through the problems, through the brokenness, through the issues. Now you're in repair. And now you look like this. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? We try so hard to avoid opening up and saying, yeah, I did go through that. Yep, I did make that mistake. Yep, I screwed up. We try to avoid it. But what if we opened up in a healthy way, not, be, not to make it our identity, no, and certainly not to hide it, but we open up a healthy way and we experience God's grace and allow him to help us put on display what he is doing in our lives because of what we did. Yeah, open up. This is what happened to me. This is what they did. This is how they treated me. This is what they said. Not, not so that you can let that become your identity. No, 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 no. But so that you can put on display how God is putting you back together. The investments of his grace. Beautiful. Let me help you see this a different way. In fact, I, I want to do something that I, I hope involves all of us. So just go with me for the next few minutes. I, I want to help you internalize in a vivid way how God is healing you. And I want to help you open up about it. I want, I want to help you open up in the next few minutes. Open up. To say, not, this is just what happened to me, but this is what God is doing, and this is evidence of the kintsugi that God is doing in my life to put me back together. So here's, here's what we're going to do. In a moment, in just a little bit, not right now, but in just a little bit, I'm going to start reading some descriptions of, of how we deal with brokenness and some things that maybe are happening in your life and my life, and... If I read something that describes you, that you can identify with, then when I'm done reading the descriptions, I'm going to ask all of us that this applies to, to stand. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to read a description, and if it applies to you in, in, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand right here in front of God and everybody. I know some of you are thinking, uh, no. <laughs> trust me. Just, just trust me. Okay? I want you to think about your brokenness, how you're in repair, and if these things describe you. If you're cancer free, or if you still have cancer, but you're fighting. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're celebrating another year sober, or another month sober. Or, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a few minutes if you've recently relapsed, but you're getting help. I'm going to ask you to stand if your marriage is stronger than it ever has been. Or, if your marriage is struggling, and you're not sure how it's going to turn out, but you're not giving up. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're less lonely than you used to be. See, we're talking about evidences of how God is repairing us, how God is healing us, how God is putting us back together. I'm going to ask you to stand if you have more joy than you used to have. I'm going to ask you to stand if you have less anxiety and less depression than you used to have. Or I'm also going to ask you to stand if you're still anxious and you're still dealing with depression, but you're still here and you're not giving up. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're in counseling for anything for anything. If you're making progress financially, you're digging out of the hole, or if things are really rough and you're struggling, but you're determined that you're going to make it through it. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're less angry than you used to be, or if you're more patient, or if you're loving better now, if you're learning how to love better if you're beginning to get the hang of this thing and you're about ready to take the training wheels off. I'm going to ask you to stand if you see purpose in your pain 
And maybe it's barely there, but you're beginning to see it. Oh, wait a second. Maybe there's a bigger picture here. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're hopeful when you look into the future. Or I'm going to ask you to stand if when you look into the future, you're fearful, but you're learning to worry less and trust more. I'm going to ask you to stand if you are a worried mess, but you're praying your way through it. I'm going to ask you to stand in just a few minutes if you're learning what it means to forgive. Or if you're learning what it means to be forgiven. I'm going to ask you to stand if you are better off than you thought you would be at this point in time. Looking back, and looking back, looking forward, looking back, you never thought you'd be here. And if you're better off than you thought you would be at this point, and you didn't think you would be where you are now, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm also going to ask you to stand if you're certainly not where you want to be. If you look at your life and say, I, I'm not happy with where I'm at, but I'm not going to give up. If I just described you in any way in the last few moments, I want you to stand. At all of our locations, I want you to stand. Look around. This is us opening up. You're not alone. And I'm not either. This is a beautiful thing. This, my friends, is Kintsugi. Yeah. Look at the evidence of what God is doing. No, I know you're thinking, oh, I wonder what, I wonder why she stood. I wonder why, he, oh, just wander on, wander on. We're going to keep opening up together. And this is a beautiful thing. You are not alone. In fact, let's end our time kind of declaring this together. Here's what I want us to say together. I'm going to say it and you repeat it after me. We're not there yet. But through, Christ, but through Christ, we're getting there. We're getting there. See, that's the attitude. One more time. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But, through Christ, but through Christ, we're getting there. We're getting there. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge there's no need to hide, no need to pretend. So help us have the strength to stop all that. That we're not there yet. We're in process, healing, mending, growing, changing. And may we submit ourselves to the process. But at the same time, help us to be careful not to wear it on our sleeve and attach our identity to it. Because through Christ, through your power, we're making progress. We're healing. We're repairing. Some people are experiencing brokenness because of what has been done to them. Other people are experiencing brokenness because of what they've done to themselves. Yes, that's so difficult. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to have pain. It doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences to our actions. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to have struggles. But what this does mean is that you are repairing us and bringing healing to us through all of that. So we thank you for the kintsugi you do on our souls. So may we open up in a healthy way, in an encouraging way. And may this unify us and bring us together and help us to know we're not alone. We're not alone. That we're a part of a family that is healing together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so next week we wrap this series up, and I'm very excited about how we're going to do this. We're going to do this by talking about how when you help other people with the brokenness that you've experienced, not only do they get help, but it actually helps you heal even more. And so this is a great way for you to see the greater purpose in the pain and the problems and the brokenness that you've experienced in your life as we all continue to heal together. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you then.